you're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Hello and welcome to The Buzz. This episode is all about graphene, the 2D wonder material first isolated here at the University of Manchester. And we've got lots of interviews lined up. But first, I've prepared a quick quiz for Hayley and Natalie, not only to test their knowledge of graphene, but to give you, the listener, a general overview. So I've got 10 questions and they're mostly multiple choice. I want you guys to buzz in, but only after I've given you the three options, A, B, and C. The first person to buzz in with a correct answer wins a point, but you can only buzz in once per question. Hayley, can I hear your buzzer, please? Okay, so I'm very excited. Um, Obviously, we're still all in quarantine, so um, that means that my quarantine buzzer is a Hello Kitty keyboard. (laughs) I'm just turning it on there. That was the song. So, I mean, it could be any note, but that's how I'll be buzzing in. Okay, and I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to winning. Very distinctive. Thanks. (laughs) And Natalie, yours? So I'm also still in quarantine. So mine is my breakfast bowl and spoon. So are you ready? Ready. Excellent. <laughs> right. <laughs> ready. I, can, I can tell the difference between the two, so that's good. Okay. Question one. Graphene was first isolated at the University of Manchester by Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov. In what year was graphene first isolated? Was it A, 1999, B, 2004, or C, 2006? Hayley. B, B, 2004. 2004 is correct. That's all. Yes. Good work. A point for you. Yes. <laughs> Question <laughs> two. On what day of the week was graphene first isolated? Was it A, Monday, B, Friday, or C, Saturday? Oh, I think that might be Natalie. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> um, I think it was a Friday. It was a Friday. Yes. Can you Can you tell me why that's important? Um, I can, I can. Because it was after work drinks. It was it was their Friday night experiment club. Correct. Oh. Where they would have beers and experiment. Yeah. Do I get an extra point? You don't then? get an extra point. You're both kind <laughs> of right, correct. Well. But, um, yeah, it's where they had their playful experiments that weren't necessarily linked to their day jobs. So question three. Andre and Constantin both received the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking experiments with graphene. Can you tell me in what year did they win it? Was it A, 2010, B, 2011, or C, 2013? I think that was was... Hayley, I think. I think it was A, 2010. 2010 is correct again. Well done. Two, one, two. You're too quick on the keyboard. (laughs) (laughs) The Hello Kitty magic. (laughs) It actually includes graphene in it. Um, That's what creates this seamless... No, not really. (laughs) (laughs) Question four. Andre Geim, as of 2020, is the only individual to receive both a Nobel Prize and an Ig Nobel Prize for his work. For those who don't know, an Ig Nobel is a satirical prize given to unusual or trivial achievements in science research. To win his Ig Nobel Prize, Andre levitated an animal to demonstrate his work in magnetism. What animal did he levitate? Was it A, hamster, B, frog, C, a small chihuahua? I'm, I'm not sure who was first then. I, I, I feel like I saw Natalie's spoon move the first. Go on, go on, Natalie, you go. Um, I think it was a frog. Frog is correct again. Well done. Question five. In another unusual experiment, Andre attempted to invent a new kind of sticky tape based on the feet of another animal. What animal did he base it on? Was it A, a gecko, B, a bat, or C, a duck? Haley, I think. I don't know, but I don't know. I'm going <laughs> to say gecko. That is an excellent guess because it is a gecko. Yes. Yeah. So apparently, it's hoped that research in this area could one day lead to humans being able to scale ceilings, much like uh, Spider-Man. Oh, wow! Well. Yeah, exciting. Uh, question six: As we know, graphene is considered a wonder material as it's extremely strong yet very light and flexible. Can you tell me how many times stronger is graphene than steel? A, 10 times, B, 100 times, C, 200 times. Oh. I'm, I'm sad that you didn't give the option of many, many, because that's what I would have gone for. A um, <laughs> hundred times? 
a hundred times is incorrect, I'm afraid. Oh. Natalie? I'm going to say 200. 200 is correct. Yes. Well done. <laughs> I think I've lost track of the score here. <laughs> no, I think I was winning. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got Gecko, didn't you? Okay. Yes. Three all, I think we're on. Oh. Three. I like a, a close contact. <laughs> Okay, question seven. Like a closely fitted graphene mesh. <laughs> you don't get extra points. Yeah, for that. stop trying to get extra points. <laughs> question seven. So, graphene is clearly a key research focus at the University of Manchester. Uh, what I'd like to know is around how many people does the university have working on graphene related 2D materials research? A, around 50, B, around 150, C, around 300. Who was that? that? I think I think that was me. Go, that was me. Um, on, I think C, 300 Three. or 350, whatever. 300 is correct. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. OK, question eight. So collaboration with industry is important for graphene research. Uh, how many industrial partners does the university have working on 2D related applications? A, around 30, B, around 150 or C, around 200? Natalie. I'm going to say B, 150. 150 is correct. And you've yes. tied level again. <laughs> Got to keep it up. For all, this is, uh, this is tight. Okay, question nine. Uh, so one product already brought to market is a graphene running shoe. Can you tell me what percentage stronger, more elastic and harder wearing are Innovate Graphene G-Series running shoes compared to other shoes? Is it A, 20%, B, 35%, or C, 50%. Hayley. Um, 35%. That is incorrect, I'm afraid. Ah. Na oh. Natalie. I've got a chance to. Um, I'm going to say 50%. 50% is correct. Yeah. You, you take the lead, 5-4. Okay, final question. Uh, this one's slightly different one to end. Uh, it's not multiple choice. I just want you to buzz in and give me the answer if you know it. So as the name suggests, graphene is extracted from graphite, which is the material used in pencils. What does HB stand for in the HB graphite grading scale? <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on, guys, final question. A guess? Hard. Hard, yeah. That's one, that's one of them, the hardness and the... Something beginning with B. Bold. No. <laughs> um, oh, black. Black is correct. Hard black. Oh, <laughs> no. The hardness and the blackness of the pencil. Oh. Oh, and after that <laughs> cliffhanger at the end, Natalie wins yeah. six points to four. Oh. But well done, both of you. I feel like a real champion. Can, can I get... A bonus point if I tell you one interesting fact. You can. Okay. Go for it. So, um, not only has um, Andre Geim won the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating a frog and done extensive work on sticky feet geckos, but he also co authored a research paper with his pet hamster. <laughs> so, he's essentially <laughs> Dr. Doolittle. So <laughs> Excellent. So that oh, takes okay. it to 6 5, so, but Natalie still wins, I'm afraid. Yes. During the national lockdown, I spoke to James Baker, CEO of Graphene at Manchester, about what the future holds for graphene. But I began by asking exactly how it was first isolated. So, graphene was first isolated in the University of Manchester by two scientists driven by curiosity. And you can all do this at home. If you take some sticky tape and some graphite and peel that over many, many times, eventually you will isolate a single atomic layer of carbon, what we call graphene. It's got length, it's got breadth, but at one atomic layer thick, it's the thinnest possible material known. But as that two-dimensional material, it then has unique and different properties as a two-dimensional material, that are unique and different to that of a three-dimensional material. And hence, it got the Nobel Prize for Science Physics 2010. But more importantly, from my perspective today, lots of industries are looking about how they use the properties of that 2D material 
into their various products and applications. How important is this material to the city and vice versa? So graphene is just the start of a whole series of other two-dimensional materials or a broader advanced materials agenda. So the University of Manchester has great capability skills across advanced materials and this is shown through activities like graphene and other 2D materials and translated into papers, publication and also in terms of the ranking of the University of Manchester. If, however, we can continue to work with industry, whether that's supply chain, small companies, spin-outs from the university, startups from the city, it also has a great potential to create not just great science, but to create jobs, to create value and to create wealth, not just to Greater Manchester, but to the region of the north. And again, we have a vision that we often talk around, which is that of a graphene city, which is the ecosystem, not just of the scientists, but of the science scientists plus the supply chain to create that whole ecosystem, jobs, value, and, and opportunity for Manchester and the Northwest. So we're now some 16 years after its isolation. What for you have been the most exciting graphene discoveries? So one of the great things about graphene is you keep finding new things every day you're involved in this job. Some of the simple applications, whilst not that exotic, are quite exciting, like adding graphene into rubber to make your training shoes or your running shoes even grippier, but last longer. So they have a benefit in terms of being able to run up hills or slippy rocks without slipping, but they also last longer for environmental benefits. There are other areas of graphene like membranes. Imagine being able to take dirty, salty water through a graphene membrane to create drinking water. Clearly, if we can make a new membrane that can create water from, from contaminated water, that will make huge differences, not just for Manchester, but around the world. So graphene has the opportunity in many sectors from lighter aircraft through to longer lasting batteries, through to new forms of healthcare and medicine and drug delivery. So graphene's got real impact today in terms of simple applications. And in the future, it may really change the way that we work and the way we operate. I have a motto in my career, which is about making a difference. And graphene truly has the opportunity, not just today, but in the future, to really make an impact and a difference to the lives that we all live and the way we actually go about our business today. You mentioned about the graphene membrane that can be used to desalinate water, which really was a big discovery, a big story, um, and could potentially be a global game changer. How far are we from, uh, from a membrane like this being possible on an industrial scale? So the membrane is really exciting. And since that first discovery, we continue to produce some great science around that discovery to understand how this membrane may work. And the work has now moved on almost to a tunable membrane. So imagine a membrane not only can create drinking water, but you can tune the membrane to separate molecules by the size of the molecule. So this is applicable not just for water, but for energy, for fuel cells, for nuclear industry. It's a huge opportunity um, from many markets. The challenge is and remains, how do we scale that up? And that's very much where the geek comes into play and into operation. But the geek is built on a principle of what we call make or break. How do we do that rapid scale up and learn? And unfortunately, graphene is still quite complex. It's quite difficult. And sometimes when you make something, it works, but it doesn't work every time or it fails and you have to learn and you have to move on quickly. So the geek has a membrane scale up line. We're in the process of commissioning that. It's a very complex, no one's ever done this before. We've bought an industrial coating machine that can produce membranes by the meter squared by the minute. We can't yet translate the process they can do at very small scale onto that, but that's the work that the team and the geek are currently undertaking. And with one partner, we hope to have a simple device in the marketplace. It's a product called um, uh, Lifesaver. It was demonstrated at our event um, just before Christmas and we're coating an existing membrane with graphene and that will be a device that you can take if you are climbing or if you're up a mountain where you can take stream water 
not quite salt water today, but it can take contaminated water and it'll remove the large contaminants from that water. And that should be in the marketplace at some volume within the next 12 to 18 months. So still some way to go, still lots of science, but probably more engineering and manufacturing. But it's one of the challenges that the geek with our partners are looking to address over the coming months and year. Another um, another area where graphene was thought to show real potential was in the creation of lightweight batteries that could even be worn um, in the form of clothing and that could charge within seconds. How far do you think we are from this becoming a reality? So another key area of graphene is that in batteries or energy storage, or actually in a new form of batteries called supercapacitors. So there's lots of interest and work around batteries by adding graphene to the case, to the membrane, to the cathode or the anode to improve the performance or life of a battery. The supercapacitors are like batteries, but they charge very rapidly and then they discharge. So you're on this continuous charge discharge. I actually think in the future we'll be talking about more hybrid type solutions, whether that's your car, whether it's your laptop or whether it's your aircraft where they may have a battery, but they may supplement that battery with a supercapacitor doing that rapid charge discharge. And graphene and 2D materials have some unique properties that make them particularly suitable for supercapacitors, where almost you get this infinitely charge discharge type of solution. And I think increasingly you'll see that on your um, cars, probably initially it'll be on buses and lorries, Vehicles that do a lot of stopping and starting, supercapacitors in particular, will play a big impact. So again, we're working on both batteries, we're working on supercapacitors, but we're also working on trying to combine those together into the structure. So whether that's into your clothing, whether it's within the wing of your aircraft, or within the frame of your car, if we could combine both structural light weighting, so taking weight out of your platform, but making it multifunctional, so as well as structural, it acts as an energy storage or a charging device, potentially we can really transform the way we look at some of the cars or clothing that we wear today. Of the industry breakthroughs that have been achieved with graphene, which have been most interesting or which have excited you the most? So the current breakthroughs are starting to get more exciting. Um, If you go back a few years, people were launching products with graphene in them, but it was probably more marketing than real features and benefits. What you start to see now through real case studies, real examples, are products with graphene where there is a clear performance or benefit from adding graphene to that product. So we mentioned the Innovate training shoe. There's also a great case study out of the US with Ford motor cars where they've added graphene to the foam that goes in the engine bay that make the overall engine bay more energy efficient, lower weight, less noise and vibration, but also flame retardant. So real features and benefit that add a value, not just for the um, car, but for the driver, because he gets a car that uses less fuel, is quieter and is more efficient. So what you're starting to see now are real case studies where graphene is making a real benefit in terms of that product or application. And you're increasingly seeing more of those examples on a daily or weekly basis. And through the Geek and our partnerships, I expect to see an increase in the pace of those new developments over the coming months and year. Do you believe that graphene has delivered on its promise of 16 years ago? I actually do, although the world is very impatient. Um, So 2004 to today, 16 years, sounds a long time. But when you consider it can take 25, 30 years looking at case studies for a new material into market, graphene is far in advance of any other new material on the marketplace. In terms of promise, we continue to produce papers in nature and science, not just on graphene, but on this whole family of 2D materials. I use the term graphenes, because there isn't one size of graphene. There are many different forms of graphene, many different types, many different performances. There is also these whole family of other 2D materials. And then you can combine these 2D materials to create heterostructures, to create multifunctional material. So from a science and academic base, huge developments in the science, in papers, publications, and interests, 
But as we've talked about, increasingly now, you're seeing products and applications on the marketplace. Still quite early, but already we recognize probably over 1 million cars from Ford on the road, several hundred thousand training shoes, and probably 20 million mobile phones, we believe, are in the marketplace today with graphene as a component within them. So you're starting to see this tipping point of graphene becoming more main scale. So I believe it has delivered, but if you talk to some people, they expect graphene to be in the marketplace overnight. Taking a quick break from graphene and it's time for our regular feature, Kids Questions. This time, Colm asked, My question is, what is the oldest living thing right now in the ocean? Dr. Sarah Mohammed Qureshi, ED and I advisor at the university, says, of course, this may be an impossible question to answer. It's estimated that greater than 90% of ocean species remain undiscovered. But Rob Sansom, a paleobiologist at the University of Manchester, has had a good go. He says, for the oldest sea animals, my first thought goes to a female Greenland shark that was found to be around 400 years old after radiocarbon dating of the tissue in her islands. So this makes her older than the USA. But a clam from Iceland called Ming gives the shark a run for her money. Counting the rings on its shell found it to be 507 years old. So therefore, this clam could have been hanging around with Shakespeare. But both these are whippersnappers in comparison to a particular species of deep sea sponge. It may barely count as an animal, but some of these sponges have been estimated to be around 11,000 years old by looking at the chemistry of their giant spikes. So there's your answer column. It's probably a deep sea sponge. And if your kids have any science or engineering questions that our academics can help with, don't forget to send them in. Late last year, the Graphene Industry Showcase took place, with guests invited to explore the key topics in the field of graphene commercialisation. My colleague Dave Espley was at the event and spoke to some of the research students and industry representatives. As this was recorded before lockdown, there's quite a bit of crowd noise. Crowds, remember them? Alexandra Jones is in her second year of a PhD at the University of Manchester, studying energy storage systems for the National Grid. Her research means that she works with a range of 2D materials, not just graphene. Yeah, there's a whole world of other 2D materials. Uh, I use molybdenum disulfide, so it's just a different chemical makeup of a 2D material. Um, and I put that in membranes uh, to kind of improve batteries. But the idea behind my research is that we want to improve integration of solar and wind sources into our power, but obviously the sun doesn't shine at night and the wind is kind of intermittent, you can't predict it. Uh, and our current system has no storage capability and so we actually can't exceed 20% integration of these solar and wind sources without some sort of energy storage system. And so what I'm trying to develop is a large scale battery that can store the energy from these resources during hours of like high production and then we can use them say at night when the sun's not shining so we're not producing energy but we can use the energy we've got in the day um, and the kind of battery that's kind of most promising for this is called redox flow batteries which is what I work on but um, they're currently limited because uh, the membrane used in these batteries is thoroughly expensive it's about 40 percent of the cost and it's not very good at its job and so I'm trying to use cheap materials and mixing them with graphene or molybdenum disulfide to improve their properties. Great, and is that for industrial use or domestic or, or both? Um, it could be either. The beauty of these batteries is that they are modular and scalable, and so you could have it in a rogue area in the desert if you really wanted, or you could have it the size of, I don't know, a shopping mall to power the country, so industrial and domestic, really. Could you foresee a time in the future where domestic users, for example, could be getting 
energy from green sources during the day, putting them in a battery and then releasing it at night and really not relying on any carbon, carbon originating um, energy at all. Well, that's kind of the end goal, isn't it, really? Uh, obviously, industry doesn't want you to do that because they're not going to make much money, but the end goal is certainly that all our energy will be produced from green sources and we just can do away with those kind of infall uh, well, fallible fossil, fo fossil fuels. Yeah, and just a final question, if, uh, what does the future hold for you? How do you see your career developing after you get your PhD? Well, um, for my future career, I guess, my passion, as I said, lies in playing in the lab. I think I'd be thoroughly bored if I went into the business side of research. Um, I don't know if that means industry or academia, I'm just kind of going to go where the, where the wave takes me. Um, but as long as I get to keep playing with chemicals and getting paid for it, I'll be a very happy girl. <laughs> Clara Skews is another second year PhD student. She is studying chemical engineering, nanotechnology and desalination at Manchester. I asked her what a specific area of research involved. I make graphene oxide membranes for desalination of seawater mainly. Um, so with, I mean, it's not really that big a deal in the UK because we have so much rain and we're so lucky actually um, that we kind of collect rain and we, we have a lot of groundwater so we don't have to desalinate seawater. Countries like uh, UAE, um, Saudi Arabia, Spain as well, um, and California um, has a really huge problem now with water scarcity that um, they're wanting to get seawater, take the salt out and make it fresh drinkable water. The way that they do this at the moment, it uses an incredible amount of energy. And if you don't have access to the grid, to, ele to electricity, you, you, can't, you can't do it. it. It takes a lot of electricity. Um, what, I'm d what I'm developing is a, another way of desalinating um, called membrane distillation. And you just need to heat water to about 50 degrees, atmospheric pressure. So all you need is to heat water and then, and then you've got um, pure drinkable water. Uh, and then I'm mixing graphene into, these, into the membrane um, to try and, yeah, try and optimize this. Okay, so, so from a, again, from a pure layman's point of view, do you actually pour the water through the membrane? Is that, is that how it works? Is it like a sieve idea or is that just a bit, is that not the case? Yeah, yeah, actually, everyone says membrane, but it, it is a filter in a way. You know, you've got, you've got your seawater with all the salts, all the microorganisms on one side. You've got a membrane or just a, a filter, or, yeah, a sieve. And then on the other side, you now have your fresh water. Um, and the the sea the salt can't get through the membrane because um, the membrane itself is, is called hydrophobic. So if you think something's that a f like if you have a phobia of something, you're terrified of it. So hydrophobic, it's, it's terrified of water. Um, so water can't get through the membrane. It has to vaporize to get through. It has to become a gas and then um, go all the way through and then condense on the other side. And so then it, um, you kind of trick the system because you know normally to to evaporate water we have to heat it up to 100 degrees C um, but because you're using this hydrophobic membrane you trick the water you heat it up to 50 degrees it vaporizes and then it goes through and then yeah, you collect the water on the other side. How far away do you think we are from having um, these graphene uh, desalination plants or graphene desalination products on the market? So I mentioned um, the the way that I'm trying to desalinate water is less energy intensive than what is already out there but in order to say that you know it is less energy intensive i need to prove it by doing something called a life cycle assessment um which is it's so important it's something i hadn't really considered but you know how people say um oh paper straws are actually worse for the environment because if you take into account you know everything that was made or the water consumption then it's actually worse for the environment than plastic well you know there's these, these sort of debates that um things can actually be worse for the environment than you initially thought sometimes Solar can be worse in some cases, depending on what chemicals have been used, things like that. So that's called a, a life cycle assessment, and that's what I'll be doing uh, with my graphene membranes and seeing, you know, actually, if they do make it less energy intensive, how was the graphene made, what chemicals were used, you know, was it actually so much energy used in that bit that it's no longer less energy intensive? Uh, I think that's such an important part of developing anything. I feel like you know, we're gonna ha we're gonna be pushed to do LCAs, life cycle assessments, on everything before instead of you know developing a product, putting it on the market, realizing oh my god, it's really bad for the environment, and then pulling it you know when it's already done the damage. So kind of doing that at research scale before it does the damage is is where I think research is going to be moving forward. And so I guess um, something like this 
as and when it does become a, a usable product, it's is, is trans transformative in terms of those countries you mentioned before who, who struggle to get uh, clean water. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's less energy intensive. You can actually use uh, waste heat. So, you know, we, we waste so much heat. It, we, we, we have really, really... Um, we have a lot of chemical processes that release a lot of um, sort of hot water streams and it's just being either chucked straight back into rivers or, or lakes and stuff like that and not being used. Whereas what we could be doing is using this, you know, heat to produce clean water for the surrounding areas. And in terms of graphene generally, I remember when, obviously it was isolated here in Manchester in 2004 and there's a lot of initial excitement about how we're, we're all going to um, have phones that charge in 15 seconds and um, electric car batteries that will give a thousand mile range and, and what have you. And almost um, the perception is that we're not where we thought we might be at this stage. Do you think that's a fair criticism? And um, whether or not you do, do you think we're almost... Uh, is there going to be a tipping point fairly soon where, where we will see a lot of graphene products on the market? Yeah, I think um, I like the impatience. We, we go to um, a festival called Blue Dot every year. I absolutely love it. And, you know, you get people who are interested in science and they come up and they go, right, I went to the stand last year what's happened since then. And it's, you know, I, I like that people are impatient because it, it pushes the commercialization. It really, really does have an effect. It thinks, okay, we need to show to people that this is getting out there. Um, in terms of composites, I think graphene is doing really well. Graphene is, is there's already marketed products out there, you know, that are available that have graphene um, in their composites. In terms of um, more sort of destructive technologies, I think, I think we need to be a bit fair about, you know, we, we only discovered it in 2004. You know, it's not actually been that long, um, but the impatience is good, and we, we we need to keep it up. What does the future hold for you in terms of your your career after you get your PhD? That is the holy grail question. I have no idea. Um, I I like the idea of um, working somewhere where you have quite a lot of responsibility, high amount of responsibility, um, such as like a startup. I think. The University of Manchester is is great, and the fact that this this we know so many people who are kind of starting up their own businesses. Um, I think I'll be going for a, yeah a small startup desalination business that involves graphene. I spoke to David Hilton, head of advanced manufacturing at Greater Manchester's inward investment agency Midas, and asked him what graphene's standing was today nearly 20 years after it was isolated in Manchester. Graphene has really kind of come of age now. It's being used in applications and with facilities like the National Graphene Institute for Fundamental Research, but more recently the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre uh, for commercialisation. It's an opportunity for companies to engage, to make use of the cool kit they've got at the Geek, uh, to actually develop new products, get them to market before the competition and you know make globally changing products, whether that be lightweight products for the low carbon transport of our future or you know filtration for water purification or you know nano electronics there are all sorts of the, the possibilities are endless the nixine journal is a no-nonsense publication providing clarity for anyone interested in graphene and 2d materials i asked editor adrian nixon and the team behind the journal if the initial excitement at graphene's isolation was dying down uh, we've probably reached a tipping point. Yes, you're right, the, the excitement did die down because people were wondering what to do with this amazing material. But over the last 14, 15 years, business has now got involved in looking at the material and finding amazing applications for it. You can put it in concrete, you can put it in composites. The, the list is endless of the things that you can do with graphene. It's interesting that you say a tipping point. So are we then literally at the point where the market will be not necessarily flooded, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll see a, a large increase in the graphene-based products that are about to appear on the market. Yes, I think in the next couple of years you'll see enormous number of products. Uh, one of the companies has got product in Primer Paint that was announced only a few months ago. So I, I be truly believe in the next few years it'll become ubiquitous and it'll, be as, it, it'll appear in material, in, in products and services, um, in the same way that silicon is in uh, ubiquitous now. And it's in materials, the material's in products already. So Huawei phones, the batteries last longer because they've got a graphene cooling system in them already. Now we've been talking to the people that supply the graphene to Huawei and even though there's a tiny amount in these phones, it's taken up probably about 200 tonnes of their production. And the way it works is it conducts the heat away 
uh, through by passing the heat from one nanoplate to another. So the battery doesn't have to power the cooling system. So it's things like that that are really sort of taking off, but hidden behind the scenes. Another example might be Ford. Ford. There are a million, there are a million cars in the world now that have graphene under the hood. Um, Ford launched it last year with their F180s, uh, and, and it's, well, once it's in a Ford car and there's a million cars, the tipping point has been reached. I asked Andrew Pollard of the National Physical Laboratory about his work standardising graphene. Yes, so a big issue we've had in graphene for many years now is that there's no international standards in place. So even uh, the actual terminology of what's graphene versus few layer graphene versus graphite wasn't defined in any way, which meant that you could have companies selling their material as graphene or few layer graphene where essentially it was actually graphite. So what we've been doing now for, for several years is uh, working with the international uh, community, particularly within uh, ISO, which is the International Organisation of Standardisation, um, to develop standards specific to graphene. Um, so uh, two years ago in 2017, actually uh, ISO uh, published the standard we're leading in terminology um, that defined standard, uh, sorry, that defined uh, standard terms such as graphene was few layer graphene, reduced graphene oxide, graphene oxide. Um, but now what we're actually doing is developing measurement standards. So a big issue um, in the community at the moment is that uh, essentially you can't compare different materials because they're measured in different ways. Um, and so you don't actually understand the uncertainty in those measurements. You don't know if uh, one value that you've been given by one uh, company can be compared to the other. Uh, what we need to help this is to develop international standards that everyone can follow. So then you know essentially you're comparing apples with apples. So say the measurement might have an uncertainty to it. You, you understand what that is. So it might be that, oh, there's a natural size of 100 nanometers plus or minus 20. But you understand that. So then if you find another material with 120 nanometers, you know that it's very similar. Um, so this has been really important over the last uh, few years. Um, actually, uh, next year we're expecting uh, ISO to publish the um, uh, standard of the structural characterization of graphene. So this is if you have uh, uh, dispersion or powder of graphene flakes, how do you measure that and determine things such as lateral size of those flakes and the distribution of those sizes, uh, the number of layers or the thickness. Um, so now uh, we're looking at that standard being published next year, which is really exciting. So then not only do you have the terminology standard uh, you've published and for companies to use, you'll have a measurement standard that then companies can use as well to say, oh, I do make few layer graphene or I make you know, a, a yield of few layer graphene, for example because this has been measured to this standard. One industry where graphene is proving extremely useful is the automotive sector. Neil Briggs told me how his company, Briggs Automotive, was leading the way in using graphene to enhance automobile body panels. An example of this is his company's BAC Mono R road supercar. I asked him about the role graphene is playing in his industry. Last year we started a project uh, it was funded by the APC, Advanced Propulsion Centre, as part of uh, the Niche Vehicle Network's uh, annual R&D um, competition, um, working in collaboration again with Haydale but also with Pentaxia who's our new supplier um, and looking at um, applications of graphene. Um, not just in the composite body structure but also in the composite tooling, uh, the mold tools that are, are used to, to manufacture the, uh, the composite uh, body panels. Uh, the net net of, uh, of all the great work that we've done over the, over the nine month period um, is that we've saved over 22% um, in terms of the, uh, the body panels on the vehicle, which is quite a phenomenal weight save. Uh, and we've also uh, made some great steps forward with regards to um, the composite, sorry, the um, graphene enhanced um, mold tools, um, playing a little bit on the multifunctional uh, properties of graphene, not just to structurally enhance the body panels, but also to uh, reduce the cycle time uh, of the composite tools. So in essence, um, making use of the thermal properties of the graphene, um, that's meant that we've been able to uh, speed up uh, the heating up process um, of the mold tool um, and uh, quicken up the cool down period uh, and thus reducing the cycle time for the, um, the time it takes to, um, to, to manufacture the, the component parts. Um, that's quite significant in two areas because on the mold tool side of things if we can reduce um, the cycle time, um, it means that the uh, 
the component cost is reduced, um, and then also by putting less carbon into the uh, into the composite part. Again, because they use the graphene, it means that um, we've we've used less raw material, so therefore that's also reduced the uh, the cost of the of the composite um, composite body part. Um, so. Um, two major, major steps forward um, towards the, the route to affordable composites, which have been have been identified by uh, the government and the Automotive Council. Um, so it's been a, a real game changer for us uh, and a game changer for the industry. This is the world's um, first production car uh, to feature um, graphene-enhanced um, composite body panels, and it's actually in every single panel as well. Um, so it's been a real, real success. I asked Faye Smith of the Department for International Trade what barriers were preventing graphene products getting to market? There's been a little bit of negative publicity um, in the engineering world because graphene was seen as the, uh, the wonder stuff and uh, basically for anyone working in the world of engineering applying for funding, if you put graphene on, on the proposal you were automatically going to get funded so there's a lot of funding gone into graphene but as we know in materials development it can take many many years to actually get things through to commercialisation. One of the good things I've been seeing here today is that it's been a good showcase to show but slowly but surely we are actually starting to see some applications come to market. These are the niche um, high value and first, first of all and that's important to, to, to give people belief because um, they were starting to, to, to walk away from graphene a little bit and, and lose a bit of belief so we're starting to see those come through hopefully that will move on to some higher volume stuff uh, other, other areas are you need a supply chain um, at the moment this is a, a new material we're not quite sure how it's going to be used in different parts and it's, you will need to put the graphene into intermediate materials that are then moulded into parts and until we really know what types of materials and what forms these are, you can't develop the supply chain. But that's a key part because there's no point in developing a new product if you can't actually make it in volume and make it cost effectively. So that's, that's one of the, the, the roles that I do within the Department for International Trade. I'm looking at the supply chain, looking to see if there are, we can, if, whether we've got UK capability and if not, uh, open this up to the international markets to come and work in the UK on, on this wondrous material. And then finally, another important barrier uh, standards. Um, we, um, we know from things like asbestos um, there have been issues with materials when they're brought to market and they've not thought through um, exactly what implications they can have on people. Um, years later you can find they've had adverse effects. Um, we found this in the world of carbon fibre. Um, cutting up the, the, the material produces particles that, that, that gave a lot of people breathing problems. We're learning those lessons now. Um, with graphene we're making sure the standards and legislation are put in place as we're developing the material, uh, fully understanding the impact it's going to have on its environment and, and the people using it uh, and making sure that uh, they're safe while they're developing this material. I also caught up with Terence Barkin, Executive Director of the Graphene Council, and asked if the sense of excitement surrounding the promise of graphene was returning. I think so. I think in the early days one of the challenges were that uh, people working with graphene didn't fully understand the nuances of how to work with it to really tease out the benefits it could offer. And what we see today is we have a much better understanding of the characterization of the material. We have a much better ability to produce it at scale and consistently. And lastly, we have a much better understanding of how to actually get it into things like other matrices like plastics, composites, coatings, um, energy storage, battery chemistries um, that then end up in real products. One or two of the people I've spoken to here today sort of imply that we're almost at a tipping point, if you like, in terms of product to market. Would that be something that you would agree with? Um, absolutely. Um, there was an article we wrote from Nature Nanotech, for example, and we talked about the hype curve with graphene and how we've gone into this valley of disillusionment, but we're really on a point where graphene is going to be rapidly adopted. And, for example, with polyethylene pipes for, for sewer pipes or water treatment facilities, that one application alone is going to need tens of thousands of tons of graphene material if it's used, even at a low load factor like half a percent. So I'm really confident what we're going to see is either a coating application or a composite or a plastic application that's going to require tens of thousands of tons that's going to kick off a high demand for this material.
that's all for this episode of The Buzz, but we'll be back soon with a brand new episode. For further information on what you've heard today, visit our website at manchester.ac.uk forward slash The Buzz, where you'll also find links to all our social media. If you have any questions about today's episode, our email is fsemarketing at manchester.ac.uk. You can also follow the faculty on Instagram and Twitter at UOMSIENG and search for our Facebook page and YouTube account. See you next time. Bye.